Hi, my name is Peter Thomas, President of Resource Compliance. In this short video, we'll examine a common vessel in an ammonia refrigeration system, the suction accumulator. In this video, we'll explore a variety of topics related to suction accumulators. First, we'll discuss the function of a suction accumulator within a system. Then I'll show examples of various configurations of this type of vessel. In items three through seven in this list, we'll consider how to properly document suction accumulator specifications within the process safety information section of a PSM program. Finally, we'll conclude by reviewing recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices for suction accumulators. Namely, we'll highlight any unique requirements in IIAR standards two, four, and six. The purpose of the suction accumulator is to prevent liquid from entering the compressors. The suction accumulator receives vapor from surge drums and evaporators and separates any residual liquid from the vapor to allow only the vapor to be piped to the suction of each compressor. The suction accumulator is equipped with a high-level float switch that is wired to shut down the compressors in the event of a high-level situation. This prevents liquid ammonia from entering the compressors. Under normal conditions, the suction accumulator contains low-pressure vapor ammonia. There are many ways that an accumulator can be configured. Often, suction accumulators have a horizontal orientation. But these vessels can also be vertically oriented. Vertical suction accumulators offer the advantage of occupying less square footage, but a downside is that the valves on top of the vessel can be difficult to access. It is not uncommon for larger systems to have multiple suction accumulators. Sometimes, each accumulator supplies vapor to a different compressor in order to provide various suction pressures at the plant. Other times, the vessels will be interconnected to operate in concert at the same pressure. Some suction accumulators serve a dual purpose in that they also supply low pressure liquid to an evaporator. Here's an example of a shell and tube chiller with an accumulator connected directly above it. In this example, the suction accumulator is also used to supply cold liquid ammonia to a plate and frame heat exchanger. The three most relevant operating limits for a suction accumulator are pressure, temperature, and liquid level. The maximum allowable working pressure of a suction accumulator will be displayed on the ASME nameplate. Under no circumstances can the pressure inside the vessel exceed this value. Since suction accumulators operate on the low side of the system, they should not even approach the MAWP, except in atypical situations. The MAWP can also be found on the manufactured data report or U1 form. Similarly, the vessel cannot operate beyond the temperatures displayed on the nameplate. In this instance, the vessel can safely operate below 300 PSI at temperatures between minus 20 and 250 degrees Fahrenheit. As with MAWP, the maximum and minimum temperatures are also displayed on the U1 form. Suction accumulators that are used exclusively to protect compressors should operate void of any liquid under normal circumstances. Should the liquid level reach the high level float switch, the compressors will automatically de-energize. As with all other vessels in an ammonia refrigeration system, Rita Book 1 recommends that the level not exceed 80%, but the level inside a suction accumulator should be much lower for the reasons stated earlier. When documenting the materials of construction for a suction accumulator or any pressure vessel, the key document is the manufactured data report. A closer look shows that the U1 form describes the steel specification and thickness for both the head and the shell of the vessel. The bottom of the page includes a listing of all vessel connections, including the size, grade, and schedule of the nozzle. The manufacturer's certified drawing is another key document to have on file for materials of construction. No two systems or suction accumulators are identical, so as it pertains to the PNID, each diagram should be specific to the vessel. Most suction accumulator PNIDs will include some or all of the following. A float column with isolation and purge valves, a relief valve assembly, a wet suction connection or connections, the dry suction connection that joins the vessel to the compressors, and liquid drain piping to a transfer vessel or transfer pump. As it relates to suction accumulators, there are several safety systems and other appurtenances to be aware of. The high-level float switch is the primary safety device on a suction accumulator. This switch is wired to de-energize any compressor that receives vapor from the vessel if the liquid level reaches the float switch. The float switch has an internal ball. As the ball float rises, the attached stem pushes the attractor upwards until it reaches the height of the magnet on the switch. The magnet attaches the attractor, which turns an electrical circuit on or off. 
In the case of a high-level float switch, this signals an alarm and shuts down the compressors. Sometimes, float columns and high-level float switches are uninsulated, while other times the column and switch will be insulated. The liquid level indicator is another important accessory to a suction accumulator, as it allows an operator to verify the level in the vessel. The type displayed here is called a bullseye column and consists of numerous circular sight glasses that are welded to a carbon steel pipe. This type of level column provides excellent protection against physical impact. Relief valves are another recognizable safety device associated with the suction accumulator. Due to the size of most suction accumulators, they will be equipped with a dual relief valve assembly consisting of a three-way valve and two relief valves, one of which is protecting the vessel at any given moment. All pressure vessels must be equipped with a legible nameplate provided by the manufacturer. The nameplate must be permanently affixed to the vessel and contain an ASME stamp, the certified manufacturer's name, a serial number, the year that the vessel was built, the temperatures and pressures discussed earlier. New vessels must have a national board number as well. This vessel was constructed prior to that requirement, so no national board number is present. Unfortunately, missing or corroded nameplates are a common vessel deficiency. When this occurs, care must be taken to improve the legibility or obtain a replacement nameplate. We'll now turn our attention to the design codes and standards that must be adhered to during the design, installation, and operation of a suction accumulator. Namely, we'll consider unique requirements for pressure vessels in IIAR's design standard, Standard 2. Then we'll examine the installation requirement in Standard 4. Finally, we'll address the inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements in IIAR Standard 6. Let's start with IIAR Standard 2, which addresses the design of ammonia refrigeration systems. We'll examine the items listed on the screen, which are requirements in Chapter 12 of Standard 2. As it pertains to the design of any pressure vessel, the minimum design pressure must comply with an earlier section of the standard, Section 5.5. Since suction accumulators are on the low side of the system, these vessels must comply with item number one. To summarize the requirement, all suction accumulators must have a minimum design pressure of at least 250 PSI. However, in especially hot climates, the design pressure may need to be higher to accommodate the highest summer 1% ambient dry bulb temperature for the installation location. Vessels with an internal volume of less than 10 cubic feet may have a 3 quarter inch relief valve connection, while vessels greater than 10 cubic feet must have a connection of at least 1 inch for the relief valve assembly. Section 12.2.4 requires that the heads of pressure vessels be stress relieved after cold forming. Vessels used primarily for oil containment are exempt from this requirement. The suction accumulator's minimum design metal temperature, or MDMT, must be lower than the lowest expected operating temperature. Most suction accumulators have an MDMT of negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Where a vessel may be susceptible to corrosion, a suitable means must be used to protect the vessel. To address this requirement, Appendix A of Standard 2 recommends painting, insulation, cathodic protection, corrosion control gel, or similar products. The addition of a corrosion allowance may be required to meet the life expectancy of a particular pressure vessel installation. All ammonia refrigeration pressure vessels must be tested in accordance with ASME Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code, Section 8, Division 1. Standard 2 requires that vessels be designed with a nameplate consisting of the information that we discussed earlier in this video. The nameplate must be permanently affixed to the vessel. Suction accumulators are typically insulated, so the nameplate must be installed with a standoff to ensure it is not covered by insulation. Moving on, we'll dig into the unique suction accumulator installation requirements in IIAR Standard 4. Section 4.8 requires that all equipment be positioned to ensure clearance is provided for accessibility and service requirements. Furthermore, the vessel must be protected from both physical and environmental damage. When installed outdoors, equipment must be in a restricted location and have a means of preventing unauthorized access. As it relates to supporting and anchoring a suction accumulator, any threaded fasteners must be completely engaged. The nut on the right is an example that is not fully engaged. Additionally, expanded concrete anchors must not be spun after they have been set in concrete. The requirements on this page are applicable to all ammonia refrigeration equipment. The final two items do not pertain to suction accumulators. Here's a quick rundown of the requirements. All equipment must be anchored and secured. When equipment is suspended, double nut fasteners must be employed. 
Foundations and supports must be non-combustible and designed for the load they will carry. Foundations and supports must not impede drainage to floor drains. Equipment must be mounted to prevent excessive vibration. And finally, electrical equipment must conform to the National Electric Code. For pressure vessels, this would apply to any float switches or solenoid valves. Now let's turn our attention to the inspection, testing, and maintenance, or ITM requirements for suction accumulators. These requirements are contained in Chapter 10 of IIAR Standard 6. All non-insulated pressure vessels must be visually inspected annually to identify pitting and surface damage. Essentially, all suction accumulators are insulated, so this would not typically be required. IIAR 6 also requires that the metal surfaces on site glasses be visually inspected for pitting or surface damage. Here's an example of corrosion on a bullseye float column where the vessel is insulated, but the column and sight glasses are not. The vessel insulation must be inspected for damage that could result in corrosion under insulation. Evidence of insulation damage includes dampness on the exterior of the jacket, condensation, frost, or ice buildup. Use of a thermal camera can be helpful in assessing the insulation. The insulation in the image on the left appears to be in good condition but the thermal image exposes areas of concern where moisture has infiltrated the insulation system. There is a requirement later in the table, item J, which requires visual inspection of the protective jacketing for cracks and holes. It is suggested that all insulation-related inspections be completed together. Here are two examples where the protective jacketing and vapor barrier have been breached. The requirement for visually inspecting the vessel for indication of degradation of the protective coating will not typically be applicable since most suction accumulators are insulated. The next set of requirements pertain to the vessel foundation, anchorage, and supports. Typically, suction accumulators are ground mounted and often elevated on a support structure. When this is the case, it should be confirmed that the vessel is securely fastened to the support structure. In this example, the vessel support saddle is welded to the support structure. The structure itself must be anchored to the foundation. This is most often accomplished by using anchor bolts embedded into the concrete below. The next requirement in IIAR 6 is to semi-annually inspect the vessel for excessive vibration or movement when liquid is being supplied to the vessel. This requirement is most relevant to surge drums that receive liquid through a solenoid valve. Suction accumulators that also supply liquid to an evaporator fit this bill so the inspector must witness the liquid feed solenoid valve energize at least twice per year. IIAR6 also requires nameplates to be visually inspected annually to ensure they are legible and attached. We've discussed nameplates a couple of times already in this video, so there's no need to go into details here. Situations like this example must be addressed to prevent the nameplate from becoming completely detached. As it relates to the testing of a suction accumulator, the first three requirements are inspection dependent. That means that they need not be performed unless an inspector identifies deficiencies. Since most suction accumulators are insulated, item C is the relevant requirement. If insulation damage is substantial, the inspector may recommend removal of portions of the insulation so that the vessel can be inspected and items A and B addressed if necessary. Here's an example of an inspection port on an insulated pressure vessel. This type of port gives the inspector access to see the vessel's shell and measure the wall thickness if desired. It is vital that the inspection port be properly sealed once the inspection and testing is complete. The wall thickness of a vessel is typically measured using an ultrasonic thickness gauge, and then the data collected can be analyzed to calculate the remaining wall thickness. The final testing requirements for pressure vessels are to test and calibrate liquid level controls and to test liquid level float switches. As discussed earlier, the high-level float switch is an important safety device on a suction accumulator, so it is critical that it is tested annually. We'll now watch a short video on how to test high-level float switches. A high liquid level cutout is a safety device that must be installed on each vessel which supplies vapor directly to a compressor suction line. Hi, I'm Peter Thomas, President and Senior Engineer at Resource Compliance. Typically, a high liquid level cutout consists of a ball type float switch that is installed on a vessel supplying vapor to the inlet of a compressor. The float switch will be interlocked with compressors so that if the liquid level in the vessel rises, causing the switch to activate, all compressors supplied by the vessel will de-energize. The purpose of a high liquid level cutout is to protect compressors from the damage that can result from liquid being drawn into the machine. 
This is called liquid slugging and can be disastrous for the compressor. The International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration, IIAR, requires that high liquid level cutouts be included in any new system design per standard two. Additionally, high liquid level cutouts are included as a minimum system safety requirement for existing vessels, regardless of age, in the first edition of IIAR Standard 9, which was published in 2020. As with any safety device, it is important that the high liquid level cutout be periodically tested for proper operation. IIAR Standard 6 requires that high liquid level cutouts be tested at least annually. It should be emphasized that only qualified persons are allowed to test a high liquid level cutout. As the test involves de-energizing equipment, it is important that trained personnel be available to restart the system after completing the test. Before testing a high liquid level cutout, make sure to notify facility management that the test will be taking place. Since manually increasing the liquid level in a vessel which connects to a compressor suction line could result in compressor damage if the test is unsuccessful, High liquid level cutouts are often tested by removing the switch from the ball assembly by lifting the switch off the enclosing tube, then tipping the switch on its side or inserting a screwdriver into the opening where the tube resided, the switch can be manually activated which will result in all compressors supplied by the vessel being deactivated. As with all tests, it is important to document the results as necessary to demonstrate what took place. After completing the test, the switch can be reinstalled on the ball assembly, the alarm can be cleared, and the system restarted. Visit our website, resourcecompliance.com, for more compliance and mechanical integrity related content. IIAR6 has two maintenance requirements for pressure vessels. First, oil must be drained as needed. Oil typically collects in vessels on the low side of the system, so this requirement is pertinent to suction accumulators. Some suction accumulators are configured with an integral oil pot. When this is the case, oil should be drained from the pot. Other suction accumulators are simply configured with a drop leg with oil drain valves. The second and final requirement is to calibrate all level control functions that are integral to safety shutdowns where applicable. For example, if the level probe in this image were interlocked to shut compressors off, if the level exceeds the set point, the requirement on the previous slide would apply. That concludes this video on suction accumulators. I trust you found the information useful. We have more videos on our channel about ammonia refrigeration and process safety management. Feel free to check them out if you're interested.